I was a desert guide for two decades. One thing I found very interesting was the causes of aridity. What makes a place a desert? The word desert is a bit hard to define, and I'm not going to bother with that in this discussion. My focus is on explaining why some places are dry, and what are the mechanisms that cause that. The first thing to understand is this. A place is dry because the air above it is dry. The less moisture in the air, the drier the place will be. I'm not a scientist. This is a complicated topic. I'm not going to cover every nuance of the topic. But if you follow this video, you'll learn a lot. My explanations are simple to follow, and I think it's interesting. To explain how does it work, I'm going to first start off by explaining a few concepts that are helpful to helping us understand this. The first is what is longitude and latitude? Uh, what is relative humidity and absolute humidity? Why hot air rises and what are the implications around that? Just the very basics of circulation and then what an inversion layer is. Let's jump in. Longitude lines start from one pole and reach the opposite pole. To remember it, I remember that they're equal in length, equally long. Every line of longitude is as long as every other line of longitude. When you move east or west, you're changing your longitude. Latitude is a lattice or bands. The equator, the Tropic of Capricorn, the Tropic of Cancer, they're all lines of latitude. Unlike lines of longitude, lines of latitude are not the same length. Imagine the following. You're standing at the South Pole with a long stick. Stand right on the pole and you spin around in a full circle. As you do so, you draw a line in the snow. When you've spun around completely, you'll make a complete circle of several meters long. This is a line of latitude, a very small one. The equator, a line of latitude that forms the equator, is much longer. It's around about 40,075 kilometers. So lines of latitude are not the same length. Relative humidity versus absolute humidity. The air always has some water vapor in it. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less. Consider some portion of air. If this bit of air had a lot of water vapor, it has a high humidity. If it has very little water vapor, it has a low humidity. We call this kind of humidity absolute humidity. If there's a lot of water in the air, this air has a high absolute humidity. When you look at a weather map on your phone, the humidity reading is not in absolute humidity, it's in relative humidity. To understand relative humidity, we need to consider another important point. It turns out that hot air holds more moisture than cold air. At any air temperature, there's, only, there's a limit to how much water vapor it can hold. And relative humidity tells us how much moisture a bit of air has compared to how much it can have. Relative humidity is a percentage. So if you have 80% relative humidity for a given temperature, the air has 80% of the moisture that it can have. If that air were colder and didn't lose moisture, that percentage would go up. This is because the colder air can't hold as much. The air now has more moisture compared to what it can hold. Why does hot air rise? Atoms and molecules make up everything. There are exceptions, neutron stars, stuff like that. But in our day-to-day -day world, atoms and molecules make up everything. This everything includes the air. These molecules have very sp specific amounts of thermal energy. When they have more thermal energy, they move more. In a fluid, this means that the higher the energy level, the more space they have between the molecules. Density means how much mass there is in a given space. You can think of more mass as being more molecules. This is true at least when you're talking about the same kind of stuff. Hot air has less mass than cold air. On Earth, we have a force of gravity pulling things down. The greater the mass of things, the greater this force. As a result, cold air gets pulled more by gravity than hot air. In this way, we can see that hot air doesn't rise as much as it floats on top of cold air. But the result is, when we have some air that is warmer than other air, that air is going to go up. 
We often think of this in small contexts. It's easy to do a home experiment to show that warmer stuff goes up, such as using food coloring in two different bits of water. But these differences also happen on a huge scale in climate. Circulation is a huge topic and I can't do it justice in this video. We don't need to understand everything about circulation to understand deserts, so let's just talk about some very basics. If you stand at the equator, you're at the point where the latitude is the greatest. As we said before, it's about 40,075 kilometers. The Earth rotates, ignore the amount that the Earth wobbles. At the equator, you're going east, or at any point you're going east. But at the equator, you're going east very fast. The Earth spins around in 24 hours, and as we said before, the circumference of the equator is 40,075 kilometers. So by my calculations, if you're standing at the equator, you're traveling east at 1,669 kilometers an hour. Extremely fast. What is that in miles? 1,300-ish? Of course, you don't notice this rapid spin at all as you stand there. You don't feel it because the air around you has friction with the earth and it gets pulled along as the earth spins. But there's a large air mass in the atmosphere and as a result some of that air has some lag behind the spin. If you were at a different latitude the spin of earth is slower because the latitude is less and uh, that causes the air to spin around in large circles and essentially this is the basics of air circulation it affects the oceans and it affects the air and uh, it's the primary thing that causes wind and wind moves around moist air moves from one place to another dry air moves from one place to another it all moves by wind and the most important uh, and most of this wind gets caused by circulation there are other factors but circulation is the big driver of wind if you've got a place where the earth's surface is cold for some reason that cold of the surface is going to cool the air above it and if you've got another area that's warmer then that warmer air can move in over the cold air and then you get an inversion layer basically the cold air at the bottom is more dense and so it doesn't rise because it's got warmer air above it. This often happens when you've got cold ocean currents and so the cold current cools the air just above it and if you've got land nearby the warmer air for, from the land moves in over that colder air and you get an inversion layer, a very stable body of air. That's all the basics and so now we can start to look at how these factors work together to form deserts. First of all, I'll just uh, get frozen deserts out of the way. There are some places on Earth that are deserts, that are very dry, um, that are permanently frozen, like a large part of the Antarctic continent. I don't know much about that, and I'm going to ignore it for this discussion. Some of the factors, no doubt, are similar, but it's not something I know much about. Latitude causes dry places. Strap in because this part is a little bit complicated, but it's interesting and hopefully I can explain it simply. This is a huge, huge factor to causing places to be dry. Looking at annual precipitation worldwide, it's clear that this has a really big impact. Let's look at how it works. The sun is always overhead somewhere. At any one time, there's exactly one point on earth where the sun is directly overhead. It's a round ball. If you went to that point and you held up a pole, there'd be no shadow. Imagine you had two friends, each with their own pole. You stand under the point where the sun is directly overhead and sent your two friends a thousand kilometers away, but on the same longitude. One friend to the north and one friend to the south. They hold their poles upright. The one to the south will see a shadow to the south of their pole. The one to the north will see a shadow to the north of their pole. Two lines of latitude are really important to our story. 
These lines are the lines of the tropic. North, the tropic of Cancer, and south, the tropic of Capricorn. North of the tropic of Cancer, a pole held straight upright would never have a shadow to its south. At the south of the tropic of Capricorn, you'd have the same, but just the other way around. The area where the sun is overhead is always within these two lines of latitude. When it's summer, it's in the northern hemisphere, and north of the equator, when it's winter, it's in the south. But it's always between the two lines of the tropics. That's exactly what the tropics are. The tropics are the region of Earth in which the sun is directly overhead. The point of Earth where the sun is overhead is the point that receives the most radiation from the sun. The sun is heating the Earth more at these points than anywhere else. The sun heats the ground and the ground heats the air above it. Hot air rises, cold air comes in from the north and from the south. As it comes in, it again gets heated and rises. As the air rises over the equator, over the tropics, eventually it equalizes and cools down and moves down towards lower latitudes. The hot air can hold more moisture than the cold air so as the air moves over the tropics it holds moisture as it cools it loses the moisture and this is called Hadley cells at the poles the earth has the least solar radiation so the air is cold cool air descends which means the air there has a high pressure and the air pushes north from the north uh, pushes north from the south pole and south from the north pole as this air moves away from the poles it heats a little as it moves north and heats up or south and heats up it rises and this causes another cell called the polar cells um, between the polar cells and the Hadley cells there's another cell we call this one the feral cells as you can imagine the feral cell is circulated by the Hadley cell and the polar cell as if it was a gear in a machine. Here's the important part. Where the Hadley cell descends the air is dry and cool. It causes an air, area of high pressure about 30 degrees north and about 30 degrees south of the equator. More than any other factor this causes these places to be dry. It at least increases the probability that these places will be dry, other factors being equal. If you look at a map of the world showing where deserts are, most deserts are within these zones. Mountain Shadow Deserts Imagine a mountain range that runs parallel to the ocean. You don't have to imagine too hard. There are several examples. An obvious one that I can think of is the Andes Mountains in South America particularly down in the south between Chile and Argentina. Imagine this, there's wind coming off the ocean blowing towards the mountain. It has lots of moisture in the form of clouds. As it blows towards the mountains, it gets pushed up. As it rises, the density of the air increases because it's squished up against the mountain. It also cools as it rises. The relative humidity changes as it gets more dense, as we've discussed before. It can't hold as much water as it could before, and so there's lots of rain. So on the ocean side of the mountain, it's lush and green. As the air reaches the top of the mountain, at this point, it's got lots of space to expand again, and the, the descending air heats up. This warmer, less dense air can now hold more moisture. It's already lost a lot of its moisture that it had before, and so with this change in density, it simply holds on to whatever moisture it had and you don't get any rain anymore. Because of this, the areas, these areas are more likely to be dry. It doesn't make them dry. It, there might be rain coming from other areas, but it can certainly be a big factor. And it turns out that it is quite common in some areas. Another factor is distance from the ocean. If a place is really far from the ocean, the moisture moving over the land um, 
runs out in the in the clouds and so it's more likely to be dry turns out this isn't as significant a factor if there's lots of rain on its way there uh, some evaporation takes place again and there's new clouds formed and so it's not nearly as big a factor as anything else we discuss but certainly it is somewhat of a factor particularly in the largest continents the final cause of deserts is cool coastal deserts these are particularly interesting to me and particularly of interest to where i used to work in the namib desert cool coastal deserts are caused where oceans are cool the cool surface water cools the air above it the warm air will move in from the land forming a wedge over the over the cooler air and this causes a very stable inversion layer because of the cool air over the uh, ocean evaporation is low there will be some evaporation but it's not as much as there would be in warmer air and the evaporation that does p take place sits in this stable inversion layer as a result you don't get clouds forming these deserts can be very unique because they're dry right at the coast often their driest part is right at the coast it also causes another unique factor because of the inversion layer the little evaporation that does take place instead of forming clouds forms fog the Namib desert where I worked had this phenomenon and fog becomes a very important driving force for the ecosystems in these kinds of deserts so in summary there are several factors that cause deserts and these factors none of these factors cause a place outright to be a desert they just increase the probability that it will be um, but taken together or without some some opposing factor it increases the likelihood of a place being dry hopefully you found this kind of interesting and thank you for watching my video if you found it interesting please leave a like or a comment or an, and if you like the, this kind of stuff please subscribe